All right. Have you wanted to listen to a podcast that's me telling you about the books I've read? Are you really bored and you need a podcast and nothing of the extremely good and high production value YouTube uh, channels cutting it? Are you some stranger on the internet who's just going through podcasts with lowest views? However you got here. Are you one of my friends who have just sent this link to on Facebook so that instead of me ranting to you in public and in your own apartment that you can just plug into the internet and hear me rant? Uh, about the books I'm reading? Well, have I found the podcast for you? So, as some of you might know, I recently moved into a new apartment, and the mortifying ordeal of moving your stuff means that you have to do deal with the mortifying ordeal of having a bunch of books to move. I had... How many books? I had three to four bags of books that I had to move from one apartment to the other apartment. And I felt horrible because all of the stuff that I had was fucking books. Fucking heavy ass books. And I didn't... I'm not ready to Marie Kondo my life 100% and do what she says with books, which is... Hey, you bought them. You've had them. You haven't read them. Let them go. Because she says not to fall into the trap of, well, I paid for it, so I should use it. But I feel emotionally invested in the book still, and I still want to read them. So I've decided that I'm going to dedicate some time every day to reading and not just leave it as a passive goal. Like, oh, yeah, like, you know, when I get some time, I'll read. No, I'm making time to read, and I'm going to finish all of these books that I have. That's the goal, and I'm doing it. I am fucking doing it. So, on today's, this week, I think I might do this weekly. We'll kind of see. I read pretty quickly, and I like to talk. So, for now, let's say weekly. Um, what'll happen with me being lazy and setting up the microphone? Not really sure but we're gonna try for weekly. If there's a weird pause, I am playing Final Fantasy XIV online right now. Um, my world is Cactar, which is the Aether server. So if you're like, wow, I just need somebody who will talk to me about books and anime and knitting and video games, and come, uh, come join us in Final Fantasy XIV. And, uh, yeah, so anyway, that's enough of a plug for me. Uh, that's like a singles ad for me, really. So, books. I'm currently reading two books right now. The one book is my workbook, and that book is a modern book. How many times can you say book in a sentence without people being like, hey, there's other words you could say novels? Okay, anyway. The, at work, at the office, I'm reading where the crawdads sing and where the crawdads sing oh and the book i'm reading at home is pride and prejudice so i'm going to just completely spoil all both of these books if you're listening to this you just want to hear my my beautiful melodic voice uh, tell you about these books so these will be a hundred percent spoiler um absolutely spoiler so if you're like i want to read um you know where the crawdads sing i think that's the title because i'm playing final fantasy 14 if i'm missing a word you'll have to forgive me you can buy the book at literally anywhere target costco the two genders um it's a widely sold book right now where the crawdads sing is a historical coming of age novel it's historical, it's coming of age, and it's a mystery, a murder mystery. So what appealed to me about what this book was that, unlike the other books at Target, its demographic wasn't divorced women in their 50s who had kids and were looking to reinvent themselves in the suburbs. I am not a divorced um, woman looking to reinvent myself in the suburbs after a divorce. So... Uh, and Target is not was not known for having a wealth of gay options. 
If you live somewhere where your Target has gay options, like, that's something I need to know because that's a place worth living. So, Where the Crawdads Sing is coming of age mystery novel. I'll just kind of do a plot synopsis of where I am so far. I'm 270 pages in out of 360. And the book is split between the quote unquote present day, which is 1969, and the past, the coming of age portion that starts in the 1950s. Where the Crawdads Sing is about uh, Kaya Clark. Well, her name is something Daniela Clark, but she goes by Kaya. The book starts and her mother Lee. Like I said, full spoilers here. So we're getting into the plot of the book and we're just going to keep on rolling. <sighs> Sorry, I'm in 14. Everyone seems to have returned. Thank you. It seems that the ruins were once home to Skylords loyal to a great worm named Ratatascor. To think that such palaces were dedicated to dragons outside of the great Hesvalgar and the evil Nidhogg. Vestagor must have really rivaled their greatness, as the ruins seem cool, they're spooky. Alright, thanks for that Final Fantasy intermission of sight text. Okay, full spoilers. So, the book starts and Kaya's mother um, leaves away from home. I should tell you the setting. We're in the marshland uh, in North Carolina, and that's where the majority of the novel is taking place. So the book starts with Kaya telling us uh, that her mother is in her nicest clothes. She's in her nice heels. And her mother, you know, just walks out of the house in the morning. And she doesn't turn back or anything to look at Kaya or to wave goodbye. And that she hoped for years and years that her mother would come back. So her mother leaves some of her older siblings. Two of her older siblings have already left before their mother. Uh, her mother leaves, and then it's her abusive father and her older brother, Jody. And she is there, and her brother is looking after her. And then after one day where... It's been a couple, it's been a couple weeks, so if I pause, I'm just doing my best where her father I'm pretty sure beats Jody and then Jody is like I can't do this anymore and he leaves. So Kaya is left alone with her father in the marshlands and I was very worried. I have to say when I started this work book, I was very worried that the father was going to sexually assault Kaya. Um just how the setting is and kind of he's like um he served in the war and he came back and he was handy uh his handicapped maybe not the best word his leg was injured and he's just drunk so he comes back and he's always drunk and anybody who he sees when he comes home he's going to beat for lack of better term and kaya and her siblings have just been really good at avoiding him when he's drunk so kaya's left all alone with her dad and she starts wandering um kind of like wandering about the marsh when he's not there and she runs across this boy about her age um who's in a, who has a little fishing boat and she goes and she gets lost in the marsh and she's crying and this boy like leads her back home and we find out that this character is Tate and Tate was one of Jody's friends. So, you know, when he saw Kaya, he was like, oh, like, that's Jody's little sister. He knew who she was. So that's why he knew where she lived in the marsh. He's not just a creeper who found her in the North Carolina, uh, I was going to say desert, but the North Carolina marshes. So she learns to fish from Tate. And her father comes home. And th what's really sad is that Kaya is having to fend for herself. Like, her father is leaving her just the barest bit of money for her to eat and to buy food. Uh, when she goes into town, like, they just call her the Marsh Girl. And 
the local townspeople are like, hey, you're dirty, stay away from my kid. She doesn't know how to read. Um, so she doesn't, she's, she's socially isolated. She's isolated because of her class. She's isolated because of her physical distance. And she's isolated because, you know, everyone in town hates her because she's poor. Does that follow under social? I think that does. Okay. Kaya. So her dad comes back, and so she's been, like, kind of using the boat in secret and just making sure that she gets enough gas so he doesn't notice. And that's something that she learned from Jody before he left. So her dad comes back, and one of the times, you know, he's in, out, in, out. And she asks him to go fishing. And so they go fishing, and... They kind of, like, have a bonding experience. They go fishing a couple times. He's nicer to her. He's still drinking, but drinking less. Um, and so she's like, okay, like, everyone is gone, but, you know, I have sort of a family. And then they get a letter from their mother. Her mother. And when, I should have noted, when her mother left, her father burned everything that her mother had and most importantly is that Kaya's mother was a painter a hobbyist painter and so she had these beautiful paintings of the marsh and her Kaya's father burned them he doesn't actually have a name in the novel um just Pa even where I am in the novel her mother we've learned her aunt's name but not her mother's name actually we might have learned her mother's name there's a chapter one second. All right, thanks for that. My guild is doing roulettes, and I'm usually like, I am here. I was going to clap, but that might be too loud on the microphone. I am here for roulettes, but I'm going to give you most of my attention. Okay, her mother, yeah, we learned her aunt's name. Oh, right, okay. There's a segment where Kaya finds the family Bible, and the family Bible has all the names. So the mother's name might be in there, but I didn't read that close enough to catch all the details because it didn't seem too relevant to find out Kaya's entire genealogy. Okay, her father, back to the present. So we get the letter from her mother. Kaya cannot read right now. And she has no idea what this letter says. And the letter upsets him so much that he just burns, um, just absolutely burns it and storms off drunk. And after that, she never sees her father again. So she has to figure out, you know, how am I going to survive with no income? She's, I want to say she's under 10 when this happened. She's very young. And so... I will get back to that and let me tell you about the murder mystery because this book is also a murder mystery. We find out that in 1969 there's this guy named Chase Andrews who lives in town and he's like the star quarterback, his family owns the auto repair shop, um, you know he's beloved by town, he's married, but he had some affairs. So in town there's a fire tower. And his body is found at the base of this fire tower. And the police are trying to decide, you know, was it an accident? Was it a murder? Uh, they don't see any wounds that suggest foul play. But there's no footprints. So they're very suspicious because it's like, okay, everything leaves tracks. So, you know, how was he killed in this kind of marsh environment? And there's no tracks and there's no no tracks of him, no tracks of other people. You know, how did he end up dead at the base of this uh, fire tower? Is That's the central part of the murder mystery. In the present day, Kaya is all by herself, and she gets found by the truancy officer, and the truancy officer gets her to go to school for one day, um, she is like, hey, there's fresh food, there's hot, free food. And Kaya's like, I love that. And she goes for one day, and then all the kids make fun of her because, uh, she lives on the marsh, and the author doesn't explicitly say that Kaya's being made fun of because she's 
poor. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and say that's how I interpreted part of the prejudice against Kaya and like her living in the marsh is that her family doesn't have money and that they're just kind of living off the land. I think there's an element of uh, you city folk don't understand. I shouldn't say you city folk, but I think there's an element of the townspeople don't understand like what it's like to be connected to the land. I don't have my copy of my book in my physical apartment, um, but there's actually a line in I'm About to Die in Final Fantasy. If anyone's wondering, there's a, yeah, I'm just that dead. There's a line in the book that says, yeah, I did, that says that people just use the marsh. They see it for what they can use it for. And that Kaya isn't like that. And she understands and she studies the marsh. And I think that line is a reference to how people see Kaya herself. That's my analysis. If anyone is out there and says, yes, what a great book. I want to know what it's like to have you with me on every page. My copy of the book is actually annotated. Okay, back to the plot, back to the plot. Kaya has, did I tell you? Yes, Kaya goes to school. She meets people such as Chase Andrews who died, he's relevant. Uh, girl who wears pearls and there's a couple other people that she gives nicknames to but they have not yet proven to be plot relevant so I'm not going to include them right now. Okay, back to Kaya's past, which is her coming of age portion. She is all alone and she needs to figure out how to make money. So the place where they get gas is from a black guy named Jumpin, Jumpin's Gas. And it's like a gas and kind of a general store mixed in one. And so instead of going to the people in town who look down on her because she's from the marsh, she goes to jump in and the book is historical. The book is written in the sixties. Uh, the book is written contemporary, but takes place in the past. So they do have some antiquated terms and kind of what we would tag on AO3 as period typical racism. So in my annotated copy of the book, I still write fuck you during part of it because it's my copy of the book and I can do whatever I want with it. So Jumpin' and his wife Mabel live in what the author calls Colored Town. I don't think I'll say that again. I'm just going to say the town where Jumpin' lives. Um, but that's what the novel calls it. Um, she lives in a town that is not called Seaport, but right now is all that's coming to mind for me. Haven's Oak, maybe? Something like that. That's the town she lives near. Okay. So, Kaya. She's under 10. She needs to make money. What's her solution? She can fish. So she fishes and she brings the mussels to Jumpin'. And so Jumpin' buys them and he's like, I can only buy so many mussels a week and other people bring me mussels. So, you know, one day you might come and I can't buy any mussels from you. And she's like, okay, got it. And so once that happens, you know, one week she does go and they can't give her, they, he can't buy any mussels. So she devises a plan that she's going to smoke fish and sell it to Jumpin' and Ma Mabel, his wife. And we actually usually are in Kaya's point of view, Kaya or the sheriff, if we're in the murder mystery half, but mostly in Kaya. And the author actually does do a cutaway to Jumpin' and Mabel, Mabel during one of these chapters. And Mabel tells Jumpin in regard to these smoked fish, she's like, these are absolutely horrible looking. Like, we're not going to be able to sell them. And he's like, I know, but, you know, she, she's all alone, essentially. He doesn't come out and say that, but he, he recognizes her situation. And Mabel's like, well, you know, I guess we'll just make it into stew. So the real MVPs of this whole goddamn book are Mabel and Jumpin. So Kaya sells all sorts of different fish, smoked and not, to the two of them, and they buy it for from her. And, you know, Mabel gets together a bunch of old clothes from the neighborhood, from her church in their city, and she actually gives it to Kaya, 
and she lets Kaya know, like, hey, if anything happens to you and you need, like, a woman to talk to, you come and you, come and you find me. Like, anything you need, any questions you have, like, you come ask Mabel. And I'm in my office, you know, I'm on my break or my lunch, and I'm pumping my fist into the air because I would literally die for Mabel. I love her more than life itself. So... Uh, Mabel and Jumpin are there for Kaya as much as you can be with... Okay, we're going to talk racism. Okay, it's the 1950s, late 50s, early 60s. Jumpin and Kaya can't... Uh, Jumpin and Mabel can't just take Kaya in even if they wanted to. The author isn't 100% explicit in if they would, if she was black or if they were... Well, or if they were white. So they're her parental figures... For all intents and purposes. They're there when she wants them to be. But they don't crowd her. Um, but in the murder mystery portions. You'll see that they're, they're definitely not snitches. So if anyone is ever looking for Kaya. They will not tell them where Kaya is. They don't know anything about her schedule. They don't know when she comes there. Any of that thing. Uh, any of that sort of thing. Kaya's personality if you've been wondering. Because I've been doing a plot synopsis. She's very shy um and she's i wouldn't say she's distrustful of people but she's very afraid of people uh and part of that is because she's been abandoned by her family in her words by her family for since she was a little girl and because she is socially isolated because she lives in the marsh so we have her stopping by uh, Mabel and Jumpin's place to get uh, money for gas so she can keep fishing. It's how she gets grits and she gets painting supplies um, as well. So she's living her life in the marsh and there's a stump near her house and somebody keeps leaving really nice, really rare feathers on it. And this is great. Kaya loves the marsh. She absolutely loves feathers. So she, what she does is she starts putting some of the feathers, the rare ones in her collection, on the same stump. And so she doesn't know who she's exchanging feathers with. But she's, you know, she's happy to have somebody to communicate with and to interact with who also loves the marsh. And so this goes on a while, and then she finally decides, like, hey, I'm going to meet the, the feather person. So she goes out one day, and she finds out that the feather person is Tate. Tate is the fisherman's... He is a shrimp man... Shrimp person? He's... He, shrimp are involved. Him and his family. Okay. So... He and Kaya start to talk, and he teaches Kaya how to read. And they kind of just, like, go through the years together um, in friendship, learning together. Kaya is super smart, and she reads at a college level. And as they get older and Kaya um, has puberty starts, um, there's a moment where Kaya starts her first period and she has no idea what's happening because she's been by herself since she was a kid and her mom left when she was like six. So, you know, she has no idea what's happening. Tate does, but he doesn't want to say anything, but she's having horrible cramps. And so he takes her back to the, her, her house and Kaya then goes to Mabel and is like, Mabel! What's happening? And then Mabel takes, like, you know, explains being, you know, explains her period. Okay. The years go on. And Kaya and Tate are friends. And Tate and Kaya become involved. And she's, I'd say she's, we'll, we'll put this at the end of the, that, which is going to put her at 15. So Kaya and Tate are kind of seeing each other in that way that preteens do. She's maybe three years younger than he is, a couple years. And so she's 15, he's 17 or 18. 
And they're starting to get handsy. You know, they've gotten to first base. They kind of get into second base. And then um, Tate's dad is actually, like, Tate's mom is dis is past. His mom and his sister. I don't know how relevant it is to the plot, because they bring it up in the early novel, but they haven't brought it up in quite some time. So I don't, I think that the mother and the sister are the tragic backstory. Okay. They're fondling each other, and Kaya wants to have sex. And Tate is like, no, you're, f he's basically like, no, you're 15, I'm not going to have sex with you. And she's not, she's pretty upset about that, because she thinks that he's treating her like a child. But she says, uh, but he says, I'm, it's not that I'm treating you like a child, it's that if something happens, you're going to have children, and, like, I'm not ready for that to happen. And so Kaya's like, okay, fine, whatever. It doesn't cause a lot of bad blood between them, just kind of tension in that scene. What does cause bad blood between them is that Tate goes off to college, and he at first says, hey, like, I'm going to go off to college, and I'm going to visit you, and, you know, stuff like that. And what, you, what he does do is he goes to college, and he never visits her. And what it changed his mind, because he's going to become an expert on the marsh, he's going to become a, like, marsh ecologist, is that he had visited one day, and he saw Kaya looking at nature but then she heard a noise and she was really scared so she skittered and she hid like she normally does in the marsh and he I don't want to use the word my brain immediately thought civilized which I don't think is a hundred percent accurate when he noticed how startled she was she he just saw how unused to society she was and said you know I could survive in the marsh but she couldn't survive out of it and so he makes the decision for her that, you know, the marsh is the only environment in which she's going to thrive and she's going to succeed. So he does not contact her while he's in college. So while he's away in school, Kaya is near the beach that the kids from the city go to. And she sees, most relevantly, always wears pearls in Chase Andrews. And Chase notices her, but doesn't say anything while people are there. He notices her, her frigate, her, her frigate, her boat, um, but he doesn't say anything until one day he goes kind of more towards the marsh beach area. Kaya has her own kind of beach that she goes to and she feeds the seagulls. So he's kind of more in that area than in like the general park area that him and his friends use. And so he starts talking to Kaya and he asks her on a date and she's kind of iffy about it, right? This is where we get that brilliant quote about people using the marsh and Kaya's not like that. I would say that, I would say the development of the Chase Andrews and the Kaya relationship is worth purchasing the book. It's weird. I don't know if I would full recommend the book because I don't know how well coming of age and murder mystery go together, but I would think that the Chase Andrew development and seeing Kaya develop is worth it. So Kaya at this point is very lonely. She doesn't have any family. She's living by herself. She sees Mabel and Jumpin, and, but other than that, there's no, no other people in her life. So she doesn't really trust Tate, but she's, she's willing to take a chance. So in their first date, it's a very nice, uh, quaint date. Quaint's the wrong word. It's very nice, uh, quaint for him because it's a picnic. But for her, it's a spread of food she hasn't seen in a long time. A lot of food. And he, on the first date, you know, they kiss. And she's kind of like, mm, because she's really shy about people has really high boundary, uh, really strict boundaries because she's been hurt so many times by people leaving her. And he fondles her and like, tr you know, they get, they get to the first base and you're like, kind of, I'm undulating right now. Kind of like, she's lying on the sand, he's on top of her, they're macking. 
And then he starts to, like, put his hands under her shirt. And then she's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, we're not having sex. And he's like, oh, come on. It's sex. And she's like, no, I don't want to have sex. And then he's like, oh, okay. And so she's kind of reluctant to talk to him again. She might have actually run away after that. I'm not too sure because she does it sort of often. Um, so he goes and he apologizes for his behavior and he says, you know, he's going to take it slow. You know, it's not for him. It's not about the sex with her and that you can tell by my voice that I'm not really convinced by anything he says. Um, so he, you know, he lets her know, hey, whatever your pace is, I want to get to know you whether or not we have sex. So she frequently sees Chase, they spend their days together in the marsh looking at different birds and shells and all sorts of things, just like having moments where they're basking in each other's presence. And then one day he has an errand to go on with, for his family sh uh, automotive shop out of town and he it's overnight and he asks Kaya if she'll, he'll go with him and she's like, oh are you sure? And he's like, yeah, like absolutely. I don't want to say it's a hundred percent a ruse. It's it's a hundred percent a ruse on his part. It's a ruse. Okay, you know I changed my mind. It's a ruse. He does have business for the shop, but he wants to have sex with Kaya, and so they stay in a hotel. And he's kind of like, hey, you know, we've been together for some time. Um, isn't it time we had sex? She's kind of like, hey, like I thought you weren't gonna push this boundary. And he's like. I mean, we've been together for a long time, and, you know, if you say no, he doesn't explicitly say, if you say no, I won't do anything, but he's pretty guilting her, and part of, she, she acquiesces, and she, in her own admittance, believes him, and that, like, oh, you're right, you know, you deserve some pussy. It's kind of crude, but I don't really, exp it's crude, but that's me. Okay, I'm paraphrasing. He, he's basically like, come on, we've been together enough, I'm entitled to have sex with you. And she kind of agrees with that point of view, and then she also, um, she's going, she's going through puberty, she does have sexual urges, so she does want to have sex. She is not shy about saying that she wants to have sex. So, as a reader, I think that he's, I definitely think he's using her, and I actually put a reference back to the earlier point a couple chapters ago. But they have sex, and what is most telling about their encounter is that he comes, and she, it's pre, she, she doesn't, and she's basically like, the sex wasn't even good. Um, so, the the novel progresses. She's still with Chase. Um, they get together in the marsh, and you know, Kaya says, "You know, we still have sex, even even though it's not good for me. I don't find it enjoyable, or like, like she's not getting that. I don't want to not light at the end of the tunnel, but like, she's not coming. Look, she has a clit. Okay, she has a G spot, and Chase Andrews has found neither of those. And if he has found them, he doesn't care to give them attention. He is hit and quit it, man. He is like, I ejaculated, I am done, I am out of here. So that's what Kaya is saying about the sex. Kaya is saying that he is a rich white guy. Okay, he has his fill, and then he doesn't care about Kaya because Kaya is beneath him. She doesn't say that Kaya's beneath him, but me as the reader, I'm gonna, that's my interpretation of Chase Andrew. So, take it or leave it. Okay, while they are still meeting in the marsh and uh, having sexual and a romantic relationship, Chase says, Kaya, like, we're gonna get married one day, you know, we're gonna have a house. And at first she was kind of like, oh my God, like, this is serious. Like, he means it. Because they hadn't, he hadn't mentioned marriage before but then since he does she's like oh like wow he means it right i'm going to have a place in his life and you know at first i was like kaya no and then i was like you know what maybe kaya yes and we'll see where i am it's it's kaya no is the answer okay so it's been a couple of years. It's been four years since Tate left 
the chapters give us the the years at the beginning. So it's been four years. And Tate comes back and he's like, look, Kaya, like, I know that I don't have much right to tell you this or to be in your life because I abandoned you. She's really mad, by the way. She's not like, oh, Tate, you know, I, I, I miss you. I love you, Tate. You know, she's pissed off at Tate. She doesn't want to talk to him. He doesn't, she doesn't want to see him. Um, she's very clear about that. I think something that's amazing about Kaya, both as in her external dialogue and her internal monologue is that she's very clear about what she wants and what she doesn't want. And I really like that in a protagonist. Okay, Tig comes back. And she says, fuck you. You left me. And you didn't come back at all, even though you said you would. And he's like, I know I don't deserve your forgiveness. Yes, King, you don't. Like, Kaya is a queen. You don't deserve her forgiveness. And so, but he's like, look, I just want to warn you about Chase Andrews because he's a philanthropist. Philanthropist? Philanderer. Philanthropy is giving money. Philandry is cheating on people. Okay. We know this as the reader because we learned this in the murder mystery part of the book, which is very uneventful, which is why I barely touched it. He died. The police don't know how... They're trying to find someone, and it, it comes together so quickly. I'll mention it all at the end of this plot recap. Okay. Tate says, look, hate me, that's fine. Don't forgive me, that's fine. Though I am giving you an apology, but it, you don't have to forgive me. Absolutely. And he said, look, just watch out, because Ch Chase Andrews is a, f a lying bitch, and he is sleeping around. Kaya doesn't believe him, and the reason that we find Tate as credible is because Tate does live in town where Kaya does not, so he sees more of Chase's behavior. He sees Chase's behavior when Kaya's not around. We get one of those rare cuts away from Kaya's point of view to Tate's point of view at one of the dances in town, where Chase is just spilling gossip about her, calling her a minx. Um, you know, talking about the sex, saying, you know, she's fight. He's exoticizing her, essentially. You know, she's feisty and she's fiery and she's sexy and stuff like that. He's exoticizing and objectifying her. And Tate hears this at the dance and he's still uh, holding a flame for Kaya. And I wrote in my book, um, you know, Tate is fighting not to punch Chase in the fucking face. So, Tate, Tate happens. Okay. So, Kaya is not listening to Tate, which, again, completely justified from her point of view. I don't think, like, oh, that's dumb. You should have believed him. Like, yeah, I'm the reader. I have 2020. But Tate deeply hurt you and left without a word. So, I think it's very reasonable for her to not take heed to anything he says. So she comes, uh, Tate comes by, you know, every now and then just to kind of like, hey, check in, you know, I studied this at university, here's a book, that sort of thing. Kaya is very well read. She goes to the library and she gets university level textbooks on loan from the University of North Carolina. So even without Tate, she's continuing her education. Tate, oh, you might be like, why is Tate relevant again? Does he just work as a fisher? When you be like, eh, does it matter what Tate does? Well, to both of your questions, Tate works as a researcher at Sea Oaks, about 20 miles from the marsh. And yeah, so he's a researcher. He's an ecologist. He's a marsh ecologist. And he, Kaya, in all of these times, you hopefully don't think that Kaya's life revolves around wake up, see a boy, go to sleep. Kaya's time is spent fishing, smoking fish, salting fish, cooking her own food, collecting specimens from the marsh, and then she paints very beautiful and detailed paintings of them. That's why her mother, being a painter, was relevant. And so Kaya takes, does beautiful paintings of them, the specimens, uh, shells mostly, shells and feathers, and she catalogs them in her house. 
And so Tate sees these because Tate was Feather Boy, right? He's very into marsh ecology. That's why he's a marsh ecologist, essentially. And she says, hey, Kaya, like, can I take some of these samples? I think that you would be the foremost expert in having a field guide on the marsh. I know a publisher. I would like to submit your work. She's kind of hesitant because she doesn't trust Tate still, but she's like, fine. Yeah, go ahead. He does, and the publisher loves it, okay? Absolutely loves it. She see the publisher. I, we haven't met the publisher. I'm going to assume they're female because why not assume your characters are female and people of color until the author proves you wrong? Like, that's just my literary, uh, my literary opinion today. That's my, that's my tea. Okay, so publisher. Kaya publishes her book and she gets fat stacks for it. She gets a good amount of money. I think she gets $5,000. And she, one of the first things she does is she goes to jump in and Mabel's uh, and gives them a copy of the book. And one of my favorite lines in the book is one of my favorite moments. The book is very beautifully written, I think. If you want a book, even knowing the plot, I'm only butchering, I'm only giving you the bare bones. I know it might not feel like it 40 minutes in, but I'm only giving you like the bare bones of the plot. But the way that uh, the author writes is absolutely stunning. And I think that if you just want a book to be entranced in an author's style of writing, that's not difficult to understand, but lyrical, not lyrical, lyrical, but lyrical, then absolutely, like, read this book. Oh, I'm gonna die from fall damage. Playing Final Fantasy still. I'm gonna die from fall damage because I aggroed something. But you know what? That's life. Okay, I died. Oh, I found where I need to go. So, Kaya, oh, Mabel, jump in. Okay, jump in. He puts her book in the window of his shop like a parent would display something of their kids. And, God, it's just such a beautiful moment. And also when Kaya brings her book and she tells Jumpin that she won't accept, she doesn't need handouts anymore and she won't accept any handouts, the author acknowledges the racism of the time and said, you know, if they were different people and if they were different people in the same time or the same people in a different time, they might have hugged, but in the moment, like, he can't, and he's just, like, smile, smiles at her. And I think it's a really important moment because I think this is my soapbox. I think that in media, we like to use historical settings and acknowledge the racism of the time in a very demeaning way, in a very derogatory way. And I get that you might say, what do you mean? Like, racism is derogatory and it is bad. Of course I'm saying racism is bad. But I think that media doesn't really try to portray any nuance to racism. And I don't mean that in a, like, justifying racism way. That's, as a black queer person, that's not how I'm going to interpret it. But I think that there's not as much nuance on acknowledging, on acknowledging like the human moments, because I think what I love about Maple, uh, Kaya and Mabel and Chumpin's relationship, is that they were all becoming as close to each other as they were allowed to, given their social and racial constraints. And I think for the author to acknowledge that and say, you know, essentially he was giving her as much fond expression as he was allowed to is really touching because it's opening, it, it's showing us that nuance, right, of the time. It's not just saying, oh, I know where I was going, sorry, I got distracted with Final Fantasy. What I like about the moment is because it would be so easy for the author to write Jump In and Mabel. Uh, or less maple because you can categorize maple into that like warm overweight black woman stereotype which i don't think the author does but you could make an argument for if you were looking at things with a broad stroke and you could also characterize jump in as like a stoic father figure who's really quiet and doesn't say much 
And not to say that there's anything bad with either of the personality traits that Mabel or Jumpin have, and that those are bad characters to have in your pieces of media, your pieces of fiction. I mean, certainly, um, my grandfather would fall into the stereotype that Jumpin is, right? He's a patriarchal, um, very quiet, very stoic black man, right? There's nothing wrong with having characters that do fall into a stereotype of behavior. So I think what I appreciate from the author is that she she went and she said, no, like, you know, jumping would be more loving, more loving through our lens and more interactive with Kaya had society allowed it. So the author really spends that moment in the text to peel back. I think that's what I'm saying. She's peeling back that layer. She's telling us just what's further down in society. And I think that's important. And I really do like that she did that in the book. Okay, that was my real talk with Briar. That was, you know, some literary opinions with me. I'm not saying that's gonna be the most eloquent thing you'll ever hear me say. It's certainly not the most eloquent thing you'll ever hear me say, but it is what I said while I'm playing Final Fantasy. Okay. Kaya has published her first book, and she uh, offers Tate a copy of her book, and she invites him over, you know, hey, you know, you're important to me, you taught me to read, do you want a copy of my book? And so he comes over to accept a copy, and the internal monologue actually tells us, like, you know, of course Tate already had a copy of the book in his lab, and he was very proud of Kaya. So I like that he, he, he was like, I wouldn't say shy, but he, he was like, didn't tell her like, oh, I've read your book and I love it. Um, so he and Kaya's relationship is getting better. She's starting to trust him um, because he, he was the one who helped her with this opportunity. Um, so she's starting to trust him. She's still with Chase Andrews, so we're back to Chase Andrews. She's living her life. She's reading the paper, which she doesn't always do, but she went into town, she made money. She also went into town and looked up the land that the marsh is on, and she bought her property with her money and all of the surrounding acres. So that's a really solid moment of triumph for her. Love that. I love that she bought the marsh, that she's worked, she's lived there her whole life. Okay. She buys a newspaper, and the newspaper tells her that Chase Andrews is engaged, and we find that Chase Andrews is engaged to um, Pearl, always wears pearls, and Kaya is absolutely heartbroken because Chase has still been telling Kaya, like, hey, like, we're going to get married, we're going to get married, and I love you, and blah, 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 so he didn't even tell her, you know no I lied to you so she's heartbroken and she hears this boat coming and so she you know runs and hides and she leaves the newspaper on her table so Chase comes by he you know doesn't see her so he goes into the house and then she's not in the house and he sees that the newspaper she left it purposely open so that he would see it and so, you know, he's kind of yelling out to her, like, hey, you know, I know you're there. Because the book is established. Kaya is an expert at hiding. If Kaya doesn't want to be found, you're not going to find Kaya. Nobody knows the marsh better than her. So if she's hiding and doesn't want to be found, you're not going to find her. So he tries to find her. She's hiding, watching this happen, and she, make, she, she just runs. And so she's avoiding Chase. And this works for a little while, but he eventually, I think she catches her at jump, she, d no. Sometimes people catch her at jumpins, but she gets caught at the beach this time. So he talks to her and she says how, hey, like, I'm pretty upset because, you know, you said we were going to get married and, like, I found out that you were engaged to somebody in the paper. And he's like, Kaya, like... You know, it's nice to think about marriage, but you were never going to fit into society. And, like, you know, 
I love you, and no one can replace you, but you, we can't be married. Like, it's not gonna work, because you're, you're too shy. He blames a lot of, um, this on Kaya, right? Now that I'm saying it out loud, it's sort of like, where Tate assumed that the marsh was not for, that Kaya was of the marsh and she couldn't live outside of it, and Tate, by the way, actually reverses on this point when he comes back from university. He points out, he was like, no, I was a fool. Um, Kaya absolutely can live outside of the marsh if she wants to. And he, he doesn't say I shouldn't have assumed that and chose for her, but I think it comes pretty close to where I, as a reader, forgive Chase. Not Chase, sorry, fuck Chase, Tate. So the difference between Chase and Tate, I wouldn't say that they're foils, I wouldn't say that they're foils. They're both love interests of Kaya, but I don't think that they're foils. They are ideological opposites, but that's as far as I'd stretch it. Okay, Chase. Chase goes the full nine yards. He's like, you can't live outside of the, the marsh, but I love you, and that doesn't matter to me. We can still stay together. You'll just be my, you know, paramour, essentially. And Kaya is basically like, fuck you, you lied to me, you broke my trust, I don't want to talk to you, I don't want to see you, you fucking son of a bitch. So, that happens. And... I'm just thinking of, thinking of the novel, because I read, like, two big things happened where I am right now, so I'm like, uh, what happened first? Okay. Two things happened first. The order that they happened in... No, no, this is the order they happened in. Yes, this is the order. I was thinking, but I remember. It was, you know, you'll have to forgive me. It was like after 3 o'clock when I took... It was like 4 o'clock when I took my second work break. So, Kaya's brother, Jody, comes back to the marsh. And Kaya is super surprised. And he says, look, I joined the army... I served in Vietnam because it's in the 60s now. Yes, it's it's the late 60s. So we're getting close to the murder part. The actual time of the murder and the murder mystery. My pause was the 60s. I'm like, is that Vietnam? And I'm like, okay, the he the v Vietnam destination for headstones is in the 60s. But it's not actually the 60s. It's like 64 to 65 that you can start having it on your headstone. I work at a cemetery. So, yes. It makes sense that his her brother served in Vietnam, and he says he's so glad that he found Kaya, and he apologizes her for abandoning her with her father, and she says, look, you were a kid, I was a kid, I don't blame you, I never have. Like, she's still upset at her mother for leaving, because she doesn't understand why her mother abandoned her, but she never has... She never um, blamed her brother. So they talk, and he says, Look, Kaya, I'm sorry to tell you, but I got in contact with our aunt, and our mother, she died two years ago. Kaya's devastated because she just got reunited with her brother, and she's finding out that her mother died. And that's very hard for her. And Jody says that he's sorry, which that he didn't have to break the news to her, but didn't want to hide it from her either. And he says that something that he did get from their mother before he she passed, what, well, after she passed, but before he came to find Kaya, was paintings that she'd done. So after she ran away from the marsh, her mother does have a lot of backstory and how kind of she ended up there, but I'm going to put that in the... It's relevant when you're, like, trying to understand the full scope of her character. But for this plot synopsis, I'm going to call it not relevant. So I'm going to say when you read the book, you'll appreciate it. Not appreciate. I mean, it's sad as fuck. But, like, it'll be new information that's relevant to Kaya's character. Okay, Kaya's mother. Paintings. She left home. She went back with her family. And she never really escaped the mentality and the anguish and the trauma that she uh, endured when she lived with Kaya's father. And that she never forgave herself and never moved on from abandoning Kaya. 
And we find out that letter that she left that led to the father storming out and never coming home was a letter from the mother that asked, like, hey, like, can I have Kaya and Jody and take care of them? To which, you know, this is going to be a little graphic. To which he was, the father responded, if you reach out and try to contact me again or you try to see them, I'm going to beat them until they're unrecognizable. And that's the end of that graphic moment. And Kaya's, Kaya's mother never really recovered from abandoning her children because she was living in this kind of, you know, should, should I go do something or, sh you know, should I do nothing to kind of keep them a little safe? She did reach out to the police, but uh, shout out to those class traders that I shouldn't call them class traders on something that's like a recording. But anyway, she reached out to the police and the police said, sorry, we don't keep track of people in the marsh or what they do. So that's not our problem. So the mother did try. The mother doesn't have a name in the novel. Did try legal recourse, but they threw her aside because... I'm gonna say classism. Okay, Jody. Jody and Kaya look at the paintings that their mother left them, and Kaya is so glad to have something of her mother's. And uh, Jody lives in Georgia, and he gives Kaya his address and phone number, and says, "If anything happens, if you need anything, you you know this is my number. You contact me." and you let me know and she's very emotional at this that she has family again and that she has she has some someone to someone to call family in somewhere that they are and he says you know if i move anywhere if i do anything i will immediately give you my new information and so they depart on good terms we have almost caught up with the 260 pages i read i know that this is a lot and if you are listening, I appreciate the fuck out of you because you're still with me here. Um, I don't suspect next week's episode will be as long because I will have already finished the book, hopefully. Probably. We'll see how work is. So after this, Kaya's living her life and she gets... She ends up meeting with Chase. I think that Chase finds her somewhere on the marsh or the beach and Kaya does not want to talk to him and he tries to convince her like hey you know just because I'm married doesn't mean that we have to s stop seeing each other I love you blah 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 lies 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 that's my analysis and another warning here I'm gonna say skip ahead a minute he does okay skip ahead okay we're all skipped he does attempt to rape Kaya in the scene that happens. It's not, it's me, I would say it's medium graphic. It's not 100% explicit, but does talk about clothes being ripped. That's the end of that warning. So I will go ahead and keep on telling you what happens. So that happens to Kaya. I mean, she, she goes through that experience and she is going, she's in the marsh and she sees Tate on his research vessel and, you know, he's like, hey, like, come by, you know, she's working on a second book uh, or a third, I think her third book. And so he's like, oh, hey, like, come look at this microscope, like, it's dope as fuck. And so she does, she's nervous because her face is bruised. Um, but she's like, ah, I can just hide it. But Tate has known her too long, so, you know, he sees the bruise. And she kind of plays it off, like, oh, I hit a door frame. And he absolutely doesn't believe her. And he knows that Chase um, attempted um, to rape her. And he's like, I... He's base I don't know if he says I want to kill him, but he definitely wants to, you know hurt him physically and uh, but Kaya doesn't mention anything and Kaya says that she didn't under this is very sad um Kaya says that the shame that she experienced over um what happened to her with Chase uh she understands why her mother left um 
And there, that was really just a hard thing to read. The book makes it very explicit that her mother was physically um, abused. But it's a little ambi- I it, It's ambiguous as to whether she was sexually assaulted, the mother, or not. And so I think that this line from Kaya is saying, yes, um, Kaya's father was physically and sexually um, abusing and assaulting her, Kaya's mother. Um, so I think that just made... It puts a light on the book. And... My tone has gone somber because I do think it's an important topic. I think it's a difficult topic to handle, and I'm not in any way an expert on matters of abuse and assault. So I just want to, you know, take a moment, slow down a little, think a little carefully. So I'm going to close that chapter on my I don't know how to talk about all things. And I guess as we keep reading, something for me to keep in mind is that there's a lot that happens and I don't have a scope of all the emotions in the world and all the experiences and that I'm going to see different perspectives from different authors who have experienced different hardships and different traumas and I'm coming at this from a negative but I mean there's of course the flip side of like there's people who've experienced other joys and stuff but we're coming off of the book so we're gonna keep it a little somber um so I think as I am exposed and see more point of views from different authors that Mm. maybe as we go on you'll see maybe I get better at talking about some of these serious topics but I can't say for sure but what I can say is there's a lot that I don't know and there's some things that I'm never going I'm probably never going to be an expert in which is just like um I'm not an expert in being uh, white. I know that sounds like a non sequitur, but I'm not. There's, you know, all sorts of things in the world that you can't, you're not good at. You don't know, you don't live. So, reading, I think, will open my horizons in a sense that I'm going to have other perspectives from other people. I hope that doesn't come off as me being like, I am going to read about suffering. I will become an expert in suffering because I don't think life is an, um, I don't think life is an exercise about only suffering. I think that I'm going to read a lot of books and be like, oh my God, like I didn't know how to do this cool thing either. So I think that it'll be both sides of the tables. That was very somber very rant-like, very unfocused TLDR. I'm going to try to treat things seriously and I'm always going to be upfront with you all. If I don't know something, I will tell you I don't know what it is and I'm just trying my best to be respectful and not make light of serious matters. I'm going to put an asterisk there in that when we get into discussions of death and they will be prefaced, when we get into discussions of death, I'm going to be a bit skewed because I work in a cemetery and not dealing with active grieving, but dealing with the mortal coil is part of my everyday life. So discussions of death you'll see can be a little skewed for me. Off the top of my head, that's the only thing that's coming to mind. Okay, back to the book. Tate notices she's injured. Kaya, Kaya. Okay. It's 1968. We are just uh, at the end of the chapter when she visits Tate. She lets Tate know that her publisher wanted to meet her in person in Greenville and that she's thinking of taking a bus because the publisher is going to pay the expenses. And this leads us all the way caught up. We are now at the murder mystery part of the book. What has happened with the murder mystery plot? I, you might be wondering in this murder mystery novel. 
what has happened with this murder mystery plot? Chase died. He was found at the base of the fire tower. And no one knows how he died. And there's no tracks. And there's no murder weapon. And all they've been able to find is these fibers from a red something or other. The other thing that they know right now is that Chase's mother, Patty Love, says that Chase always wore a shell necklace. And the shell necklace wasn't with his personal effects when his body was at the coroner. And she thinks that's suspicious as fuck. And she tells the sheriffs that the necklace was made by Kaya years ago. And we see Kaya make this necklace. So uh, the narrative does entwine the murder. Some of, I'm not going to call them MacGuffins and I'm not going to call them red herrings. They do put part of the murder mystery evidence in the, um, in the coming of age portions. So we saw Kaya make the necklace. Like we found out about the necklace from Patty. And then, you know, when it's Chase and Kaya getting together, it tells us about the necklace. So they're intertwined. So we learned that, you know, there was this, necklace that he wasn't wearing and that's suspicious he think uh the mother thinks that kaya took it after killing chase and we learn from two fishermen that they saw kaya on a boat the morning of the murder and we learn that two clerks from the store saw kaya leaving town she was out of town on the day of the murder um, Kaya has been evading arrest because she's skittish of people and shy and has been since she was a child. And so when the police, when she hears their boats coming to the marsh, she always runs. And so they use this as justification for a search war warrant on her house. And so they find a red cap that is an exact match to the murder, the fiber that was left on Chase's uh, body and they use that as the circumstantial evidence to bring her into holding since Kaya has quote unquote evaded police I shouldn't say quote unquote okay she's going to get gas and um, usually jump in waves to her when she's boating in and so she waves to him, but he doesn't, like, wave or acknowledge her. And she realizes too late that, because he's trying not to tip him off to her presence, so she realizes too late that they've set a trap for her. So they do get her into police custody. And because she's evaded um, police custody, she's being held in prison. While, or she's being held in a holding cell um, on no bail during the trial. She originally had a court appointed lawyer because she didn't have anyone for her own defense. And the lawyer that they had appointed to her was like an absolute new person um, who like absolutely like would not be able to represent her well. But they just were kind of like, ah, oh, she's the Marsh girl. And when a, a more experienced lawyer hears about this and he takes up the case pro bono so she's at trial um the lawyer did try to get her trial moved because he thinks that there's prejudice against her because she's quote unquote the marsh girl the judge is noted to be very fair but he denied the request i'm glad that the judge was fair uh, in his description and that he's not like slimy um and so a lot of the court proceedings, I'm only like read one court scene so far, is kind of hinting like they're against. I wanted to punch the prosecutor personally. Uh, I was reading in my office and I wanted to punch the prosecutor. So the two, fi the only people who've testified are the two fishermen, and the two fishermen say that they came over. They were sure it was Kaya and Chase that were on the beach that day. This is in the morning, not in the evening of the murder. And that they had gone over because it sounded like someone needed help. And when they got, uh, warning again, sorry, this is a uh, warning for the aftermath of attempted assault. Skip forward a minute. They saw her and that she was partially undressed and that she was cursing, and she said, if anything happened, I'll kill you. 
and end warning. Do I wait for silence? Let's hang out for a sec while we give that full minute that we said we would. How we doing? I'm playing Final Fantasy still. I'm uh, hunting some limestone golems here. We've got another 30 seconds, but better to overestimate than to underestimate is what I say. Who do I say that to? Who really knows? I'm doing some side quests. I'm level 60, but my side quests are level 55. So I'm leveling up my red mage uh, and killing everything with my monk. So, because my red mage is pretty garb at doing damage and not dying on its own. And we're three, two, one, we're back. Okay, so the fishermen say that they heard fighting and they saw Kaya uh, cursing at Chase and the defense is like, you know, was she distressed? Like, was she in need of help? And they're like, absolutely. Like, it did not, it looked like she needed help to where, the, what the prosecution asked. Was like, did you hear her say she would kill him? So that's what the prosecution is spinning. And I am so pissed at the prosecution because I'm like, you filthy fucking motherfucker. I mean, your job is to prosecute, but like, fuck you. Because like, you heard the testimony, you heard that she was in trouble and you decide to spin it just to be like, well, you heard her cursing and said, like, I'll kill you. Like, fuck you. Fuck you, prosecutor. I'm sure as this case goes on, I'm only going to dislike you more. So that's where we are in the book. You've been with me an easy breezy 70 minutes. And you're now caught up to uh, where the crawdads sing. Yes. And... We're going to find out what happens with the with the murder mystery plot. I say that if there is a murderer, it's going to be Tate. If there's not a murderer, or or it could be Pearl. Could be his mom. I don't know. I would say the book is foreshadowing Tate. But it could kind of be anyone. It's not. It's The murderer is definitely not Kaya. Um, because I believe the book that Kaya was out of town. But maybe the book just wants me to believe that I believe that Kaya was out of town. So, we finished book one. Let me fill you in much faster. You know what? No, let me fill you in on Pride and Prejudice now. Because if I don't, there's going to be more stuff. <sighs> Pride and Prejudice is written in 1813. At first I thought it was both boring and exciting. Now I just think it's old and exciting. The basic premise of Pride and Prejudice is... You got a family. You got five daughters. They got to marry people because your estate is actually going to a cousin and not to you. So when you die, your kids have nothing. That's the plot of Pride and Prejudice. A hot new thing moves into town. His name, uh, The main fam character's family is the Bennets, and their kids in this order are Elizabeth, Jane, Mary, Kitty, which is Claudia, and Lydia. Okay. There's this hot new thing who moves into town. His name is Mr. Bingley. And he's an eligible bachelor. He makes five or six thousand pounds a year. So the Bennets are hoping like, oh hell yeah, we've got five daughters. You've got one you. Let's, let's make something happen here. Mr. Bingley lives near them. I would say in town, but I have no idea what the actual geographic space is. Three miles away. They're three miles away. Um... He lives three miles away from them, and he's the hot new thing, and they're hoping to, you know, marry one of their daughters to Mr. Bingley. Um, you know, at first he's like, oh, I'm like an Elizabeth, um, but Elizabeth is, is fiery. She's very much like, I'm going to do what I fucking want, and I'm going to say what I fucking mean. And so he is like, you know, I respect Elizabeth, but, you know, I think I like Jane. Jane is sweet. Jane is contemplative, but she's not afraid to express her opinion. So, Mr. Bigley is pretty keen on Jane. I'm almost a third, no, uh, I'm like 16 chapters in. So, um, let me just tell you characters. Mr. Darcy, uh, the people who live with Mr. Bigley is his sister, his sis, two sisters, uh, one younger, one older, and his older sister's husband. 
and Mr. Darcy. Mr. Darcy is probably the pride and the prejudice of the novel. I don't really know where the name title comes from. But he's basically like, fuck everyone who's not me and not Mr. Bingley and not my sister. And he and Elizabeth uh, butt heads because Elizabeth is headstrong. And Elizabeth is not afraid to tell him, like, hey, fuck you. Like, you ain't hot shit. And so... What's happened plot-wise in the book? Mr. Bingley's moved in. He's held a ball. They've all gone to the ball. He gets the hots for Jane, Elizabeth, and he's like, you know what? Maybe Jane. He and his family and his household have dinner a couple times with the Bennets, and um, this just, you know, solidifies his relationship with Jane. And Jane's mother, Mrs. Bennet, tries to get them together, and so Jane gets an invitation to Mr. Bingley's house, and Mr. The mom doesn't give her the horse. And she's like, oh, it's going to rain, so you won't be able to come back, so you'll have to stay in the night because we can't lend you the carriage. And so what happens is that Jane gets sick. And so she gets stuck there because she's sick. And her family is like, well, this sucks. We still don't, like, have the horses we can trade or, like, the horses we can use to get him, uh, get our daughter. And... Elizabeth says, fuck this, fuck you, I am going to his fucking house, and I am going to make sure that Jane is okay. And they're like, he lives three miles away, and she's like, I don't give a fuck, she's my sister, I am not gonna not check on, uh, check up on her. So, she, Elizabeth walks three miles to her, uh, Mr. Bickley's house, and Mr. Bigley's younger sister and older sister are like, this girl's fucking ridiculous. Did you see her? She's covered in mud. She's thrown some shade at Mr. Um, Darcy. And they're kind of like, who does she think she is? Because they are they have more money than uh, her family. Um, but Mr. Bigley is like, hey, lay off. Like, you know, she's worried about her sister. You know, she's worried about her sister. Don't be a dick. And... He just wants to make sure that Jane is doing better because he is smitten for Jane. And while they're there, um, we see some character dynamics. I think what's interesting about Pride and Prejudice, which I never thought I was going to say, mind you, because I started this book and I thought it was boring as fuck. And I texted my housemate on how I wanted to fall asleep and that was boring. And now I, you know, I went to work for eight hours and I'm like, man, I can't go home to read fucking Pride and Prejudice. So, you know... We all have our character development. Okay, character dynamics. Darcy is intellectually, like, digging Elizabeth. Not as a person, because they fight, but because the, she's not afraid to speak her mind. And she's not afraid to say, fuck you. Um, fuck you, you're wrong. Fuck you, you're too stubborn, you know. And he likes that, because he is too stubborn. And nobody ever tells him no. He's rich as fuck, too. He makes twice as money, twice as much money as Mr. Bigley, so he's, like, worth 10,000 pounds a year. Can't imagine how much that is now. Can't imagine how much that was back then. He's a baller. Okay. So, character, one of my favorite interactions is all the women are talking, they're all talking, they're in the parlor, uh, all the characters, Darcy, Bingley, <sighs> Miss Bingley, Mrs. Hurst, and Mr. Hurst, who are the older siblings of Mr. Bingley. And they say, like, hey, like, you know, some women say they're accomplished, but they're not really accomplished. And how can you be accomplished if you don't speak a language and you don't... It's like getting into college. If you don't speak a language, if you don't play an instrument, if you don't speak multiple languages, if you don't do multiple instruments, if you can't embroider, if you can't, you know, do this and do that. And some of the people are like, oh, yes, absolutely. And Elizabeth is like, wow. And Mr. Darcy, of course, is, you know, pioneering this movement. And his, like, manservant is, like, agreeing with him. And then, oh, I love this exchange. Elizabeth is like, wow, I'm surprised. And he, they were like, what? And I'm like, I'm surprised you know any women at all who qualify as being exceptional. If this is your um, perception of an exceptional woman, I can't say that I know any. And... Of course, Mr. Darcy is like, oh, my sister is exceptional. He says this before her clap back. And I don't take that as a weird, like, I want to fuck my sister moment, but more as a, like, oh, yeah, I'm biased towards my sister because I'm related to her. And so what happens? I'm just thinking. 
just thinking, oh, the women uh, interpret this, uh, Mrs. Hertz and Miss Bingley, and after Elizabeth leaves to go make sure Jane is okay, because she's staying with the Bigleys until Jane gets better and can be transported back home. The women take this to mean, like, oh, like, she's one of those women who are always putting other women down. And I just thought this was wild, because when I read it, I was like, no, you fools. This isn't her being against women. She drank. I, I would clap, but again, I don't know how bad that'll... Okay, I hope that doesn't spike too much. This is not her being against women, okay? Like... Elizabeth Bennett loves women. She drinks that loving women juice. I'm just saying, I know that she's sh probably straight because it's 1813. But, like, and yeah, I'm sure we read her as a feminist. But I want to read her as gay because I'm gay. Anyway, Elizabeth Bennett wakes up and she drinks that respecting women juice. And nobody else in this fucking world does. And she is ahead of her time. It's 1813. But she, if I had, I wish I had Elizabeth Bennett with me in my real life. I really do. Because when men are like, when, this is my opinion. This is me going off on a soapbox. But it's fun. We've got men in your real life who are like, oh, like, do girls do this? Can she cook? Can she clean? Can she hold a job? Does she do her laundry? Does she have hobbies? Does she bake? Does she know about cars can she build a pc like right like men have these really high expectations of women that are impossible to meet and i would want elizabeth bennett here to be like why are you like this people can't be all of those things and you expect that to be the baseline like that's too much ex expectation this is my takeaway from all of pride and prejudice you can't put all of your expectation and have super high expectations all on one person. We're all people. We're all going to make mistakes. We all have strengths and weaknesses. And to expect all people to make this meet the same baseline of excellence when that baseline is super high is unrealistic and will just set everybody up for failure and unhappiness. This is my takeaway from Pride and Prejudice. I will say nothing greater today, probably. Okay. Getting off of my I love Elizabeth Bennett pedestal. Sorry, I'm looking something up on the computer and I didn't want to get too close to the mic. Okay, Pride and Prejudice. Okay, okay. The other interesting character dynamic. Oh my god, the Final Fantasy wiki has changed its layout. Good for it. I'm going to Lenoska 31 to 4. I should do that in a like cool voice, but I don't know any like sultry voice for your soul so we'll just keep it real okay so the other interesting character uh interaction that we had was with uh mr ben not mr bennett darcy and miss bigley and what happened <laughs> <I should. laughs> okay what happens is that Mr. Darcy is writing a letter to his sister uh, back wherever the fuck he lives. And <laughs> Miss Bigley is like looking over and commenting on like every single thing that he does. He's like, oh, like tell your sister I said hello. And he's like, I already did. And he's like, she's like, oh, your handwriting is beautiful. And like, oh, you write so fast. And like, oh, your line spacing is really good. So he's like commenting on like literally everything that he's doing. And he like just doesn't care. Like you can tell that he's completely like disinterested in this running commentary. And he's just trying to like write a fucking letter. And it's wild because I'm he, absolutely Miss Bigley wants Mr. Darcy's dick. And she's mad because Elizabeth is around and getting some of Mr. Darcy's attention when, like, you know, by all, you know, in her mind, she's the one who should have Mr. Darcy, right? She's known him for longer. She has the status. She's more cultured. Um, stuff like that. The Bigley sisters really dislike Jane. Um, they make fun of her for walking three miles to see her sister. They're very uncharitable. They're very kind of mean-spirited people. Um, but I suppose we'll find out as we read the book if that's, like, a class issue or if they're just like that. Because since it's a historical book, I'm not too sure how the time period falls. Okay. So that's another funny interaction. So, Miss Bigley wants Darcy's dick. And Darcy is intellectually stimulated by Elizabeth. And so as Elizabeth stays at the Bigley estate, he's like, oh, fuck. She's 
he already like thought that she was attractive, but then she talked and he's kind of like, mmm, she's got opinions. But now like he's kind of like, oh no, she's hot and she's smart. So he's kind of like falling for her, but he doesn't want to like come on as to having interest in her. And the other thing that happens in the book is that the cousin who the Bennett's estate is going to go to comes over to make amends for getting the estate bequeathed to him. And we find out that he has a benefactor who is a very long name. We're just going to call her by her first name. Her first name's Catherine. And his, his plan to make amends is, look, the Bennett's got five, do five daughters. I've got money. If I marry one of them, the right will be wronged. And so um, the Bennett's kind of think he's a blubbering idiot. Like, he's very humble in manner, and he's nice. But, like, the words that come out of his mouth are stupid. Um, and so he plans to marry one of the daughters. Mrs. Bennett is totally like, yes, if my girls get married to someone, good for them, as long as they have a fair standing. So Jane is pretty locked in to Mr. Bingley. If they don't get married, you'll know, because I'll record about it, and there will be a riot. Uh, I know how the book ends because I've consumed pop culture in the last 20 years. So I know Darcy's going to end up with Elizabeth. And I don't know what happens to the other three sisters. So uh, the cousin is like, oh, hey, like, Jane. And he ch and Mrs. Bennet is like, no, she's she's going to get she's probably going to get married to to someone already. And he's, and in like that instant, he's like, all right, Elizabeth. And I wrote in my note, I'm like, there is no way he can handle her personality. Elizabeth will chew this motherfucker and spit him right back out. So, sh absolutely not. And I'm like, how dare he not see that Elizabeth is a queen who is better than him. So, um, we also find out uh, the two younger sisters, Kitty and Lydia, have a thing for the, um soldiers that come into town and because they're like strapping young men i guess and so there's a new guy a new military guy who comes into town and his name is mr wickham and there's mad beef between mr wickham and darcy and elizabeth sees when they pass each other and that they're kind of like making bad faces at each other and so when there's a party at the bennett sisters aunt's house uh, Mr. Wickham is, like, kind of taking a shining to Elizabeth, and I'm here for that. And he's like, oh, yeah, that beef between me and Darcy. And she's like, oh, my God, spill the tea. And so what happened was that Darcy's dad died, passed. And when da Darcy's dad um, passed, he left a sizable amount of his wealth to Mr. Wickham. And Darcy is apparently prideful and jealous of this. And because not only was Wickham left with material needs, but Darcy's dad really did like Mr. Wickham as a person. And so Mr. Wickham is kind of like, yeah, that's why Darcy like screwed me out of the inheritance I should have gotten in the will. And Elizabeth is like, oh my God, he went against the will. And then he says that Mr. Uh, Darcy's dad didn't actually put it in the written will. It was like, um, it was like a verbal type deal and that Darcy disputed it. So, uh, for two years, Mr. Wickham was living on the money that he was bequeathed from Darcy's dad, but Darcy's dad, uh, Darcy was like, fuck you. And that's why there's bad blood between Mr. Wickham and Mr. Darcy. And Mr. Wickham seems kind of okay to mend bridges if Darcy is, but Darcy's too prideful to do it. And we find out that Darcy's aunt is... Sorry, it was convoluted. Darcy's aunt is Catherine, who's the sponsor for the Bennett's cousins. Yeah, I know. Well, I'll say it one more time. The Bennett's cousins' benefactor, Catherine, is Darcy's aunt. And that Darcy's aunt and someone else in Darcy's family are going to combine Darcy's estate anyway. So Elizabeth comments that it's kind of useless for him to be putting all this work into it when, like all the reputation of it's gonna change um, because the estate's gonna get merged. And um, Elizabeth is taking quite the shining to Mr. Wakeham and she's, she's hoping that that goes somewhere. 
and that is my update on Pride and Prejudice. I'm liking it a lot more than I thought I would because I really was reading those first 30 pages and I was like, yes, kill me. So it's been a fun read. This was a very long episode and to anyone who listened all the way through to this, I love you and appreciate you and hope to see you next week when I talk more about the book I, books I'm reading. Hopefully we'll have finished Crawdads, but it's not too dense, um, but we'll see. Also, if people tell you a book is dense, everybody has a different level with books and reading. And if they're good at reading, if they're bad at reading, if they're okay at reading. A lot of people have told me Pride and Prejudice is really dense. I've had two people tell me that. And I don't find it dense. I just find it historical. I read like it's the oxygen that I breathe. So the hardest thing about Pride and Prejudice has been getting into early 19th century writing. So I think, you know, as you go through your life with books, you know, some books that other people think are really hard, you m might not find hard. And some books that you think are really difficult. Okay, if you think a book is hard, somebody is going to think it's easy. If you think it's easy, somebody is going to think it's hard. For example... Well, to be fair, my friend does think this author is hard to read, but he's able to do it still. I have a friend, love him to bits. I'm sending him this link, so I'm hoping he listens to it. He loves Toni Morrison, absolutely loves her. I find her reading lyrical and dense at the same time, and I am either need to be 100%. If I'm not 100% into it, it's not going through my brain. So if I'm in... A good mood then I'm set but otherwise it's not it's not working for me but I have a friend who absolutely loves Toni Morrison he has just about all of her books favorite author on the flip side I have a co-worker and he hates Steinbeck he's like come on we know about the Great Depression you don't need to talk about it and so but I I I know I wouldn't say I find Steinbeck refreshing because of his uh, subject matter but you know it's Steinbeck I find him easy, a, a fairly easy read he's not as easy to me as maybe reading an Orwell um, but I'd much I'd have a much easier time reading um, a Steinbeck than a Hemingway that is to say all kind of authors write in different styles and even when you're reading the same book as somebody else everyone's gonna f interpret and interact with that piece differently and I think that's one of the amazing things about the human experience is that we can be consuming the same media and taking completely different things from it and having different experiences with that work. So Pride and Prejudice not being a hard read, I think is making it enjoyable for me. Uh, I think if it was a hard read, I would have a, a different opinion about it. So both of these reads are, um, for me, easier reads. Um, where the Crawdads Sing is probably, in general, I would say an easier mark because it is a contemporary novel that just came out probably this year with how widely it's been sold to where um, Pride and Prejudice is from 1813. But that being said, I'm so glad if you listened all the way through and I love you listener out there and you're the best around and nothing's ever going to keep you down. But before I get hit by the copyright by bots that will surely not be here on this size podcast, um, I'm just uh, glad to be using my microphone, glad to be writing a podcast, and I hope that you guys will uh, continue to be with me while I journey through my bookshelf and uh, read all these books. So take care and see you guys next week. Bye.